So, Claire. Yeah. If you give your dog just a little bit of chocolate, that's okay, right? Oh, I don't know. Does it depend on the type of chocolate? <laughs> and if your dog's eating grass, well, that is a clear sign that his stomach is upset, right? Today we find out the truth. Hello, I'm James Jacobson in Maui, Hawaii. And I'm Claire Mansell in London, England. Welcome to Dog Edition. Where voices from around the world consider all things dog. Dog Edition is the first show designed for you to listen to while you walk your dogs. Today on the show, we are sniffing out the truth about common dog myths. That's right. This is our second installment of Dog Myths Debunked. And we have enlisted the help of a few experts to get to the bottom of these two dog myths. Is it okay for our dogs to have a little chocolate? And if our pooches eat grass, does it mean that they're feeling sick? We'll let you know whether the myth has been officially busted. Or whether we give it our paw of approval. (laughs) That and more on today's show. So if you love dogs as much as we do, pause what you're doing, leash up your pup, and let's go for a walk. Because we've got a lot to talk about on today's episode of Dog Edition. Hey, Pepper, want to go for a walk? You know, Jim, I've always heard that as long as it's not dark chocolate, it's not too big a deal to let your dog have a little bit of chocolate. Never tried it, but that's what I've heard. I've heard that as well. But just to be on the safe side, I made sure that my dogs never, ever had any chocolate if I could possibly control it. And I was not able to once. (laughs) But of course, accidents like I experienced can happen and not everyone feels the same way. We went to some dog parks around the world to see what fellow pet parents had to say about giving their dogs chocolate. I'm pretty sure that everything's poisonous in certain amounts, but that tells me also that they can probably have some amount and they won't hurt them too much. I was under the impression no, but my father says as long as it's white chocolate, it was good. They can have a small amount and then they'll get like diarrhea, but you know, they should not have any. I heard dogs aren't supposed to have chocolate. Dogs are not supposed to have chocolate. However, my grandmother used to give her dog Buttons a Hershey's Kiss every night before bed, and that dog lived to be about 14. I don't give my dog any chocolate ever because I don't want to take that risk, so no. Interesting hearing some of the wisdom passed down there, isn't it, about the grandmother (laughs) and the dog lived to be 14. This is also how myths uh, perpetuate, right? Yeah. Kind of handed down old wives' tales, in quotes. Were you ever told anything about chocolate and dogs and the safety of it or not yes i was told that it is very 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 poisonous and very 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 bad and then one day many 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 years ago i left the house and someone had given me a bag of hershey's kisses i came back and there were a lot of hershey kiss little wrappers all up and down the steps oh yes i got very very scared and because i had a little maltese at the time named maui and i took her to the emergency veterinarian and they pumped her stomach and all was well i don't think she'd gotten that much and this was kind of like really light milk chocolate for valentine's day but it scared the bejesus out of me i was i was petrified Probably didn't get that much because it's really difficult to unwrap those little Hershey's kisses, especially I, if you haven't yeah. got opposable thumbs. I mean, that's uh, no be tricky. No opposable thumbs, just those <laughs> teeth. Yeah, yeah. And there was just a lot of foil. And I think she had as much foil as she had chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's hear from our first guest and let them weigh in on the safety of chocolate. There's a lot that goes on with chocolate. It isn't just chocolate is chocolate. And the reason for that is because of the many different types of chocolate that's out there. I am well experienced with the many different types of chocolate out there. Mm. That's Dr. Renee Schmidt. She's a senior veterinary toxicologist at Pet Poison Helpline. Now, obviously, there are different kinds of chocolate, dark or baker's chocolate, milk chocolate, white chocolate. There's American chocolate, which isn't that good. And there's British chocolate, (laughs) which is great. But what's in the chocolate, whichever type it is, is toxic to dogs. And the big concern we have with the ingredient that's in chocolate is theobromine. So that's the component that is, it's in a class called methylxanthines, which includes caffeine and theobromine. And that's the one that we get really concerned about. 
Theobromine is present in the cocoa powder and basically what makes chocolate chocolate. And the amount of cocoa and therefore the amount of theobromine determines what kind of chocolate it is. The sweeter the chocolate, the more sugar it usually contains and the less cocoa powder or cocoa, actual cocoa that is in there. So white chocolate just contains cocoa butter, very little theobromine in there. However, Baker's chocolate or a semi-sweet chocolate has a large amount of theobromine in there. So the first determining factor of chocolate toxicity in dogs is the type of chocolate. Mm -hmm. The darker the chocolate, the more toxic it is to dogs. Exactly. So chocolate isn't sounding so good. The second determining factor is the amount of chocolate that is ingested. Here's Dr. Schmidt. The dose makes the poison. If a pet gets into one or two Hershey Kisses, the milk chocolate, not going to be a big issue. Even in a small dog, they can certainly have some stomach upset or pancreatitis developing. But as far as poisoning goes, not usually going to be a big deal. I'll tell you what you could have done with her comforting words a few years ago, couldn't you? I mean, that, mm -hmm. that was almost written for you. That's amazing. It was. Dr. Schmidt says that breeds like Schnauzers and Yorkies can sometimes be even more susceptible to pancreatitis or to have stomach upsets after ingesting smaller amounts of chocolate. But it's common sense that the more chocolate is eaten, the sicker a dog can get. Now, I'll tell you a story. When we had two dogs, and one of them wasn't Maple, this is before her, they got into a packet of chocolate chip cookies. And the math that I had to do was just mind-blowing <laughs> because obviously... There's chocolate in it, but it's not fully chocolate. So I was kind of looking at the cookies and going, well, I ate one before we went out. So there were 12 in the pack and now there's 11 <laughs> when I left. And it says on the ingredients, it's this much percentage chocolate and, and it weighs this much. And oh, it was, yeah. So, so it's the I, ultimate I, word problem yeah. when you're a little stressed, <laughs> like, you're is stressed, my dog yeah. going to die? <laughs> yeah, exactly. High consequences to that, to that math problem. And this also leads into something else, which is that the two dogs we have, one was a small one, a beagle, and one was a big one, just crossed with a great Pyrenean and she was. And size, of course, factors into this as well, doesn't it, Jim? Size does matter, absolutely. Another of our experts, Dr. Noble, who works at the University of Liverpool and has published a paper about chocolate toxicity in dogs. Liverpool, I'm imagining that he gets some of that British chocolate. Mm -hmm. He has published a paper about dogs eating chocolate around Easter and Christmas. We'll get into that and why that is significant in a bit. But both he and Dr. Schmidt agree that the third determining factor is the size of the dog. So, you know, a Great Dane eats a bar of chocolate, he's probably going to get away with it without having a problem. But if a, a, a sort of Jack Russell eats the same bar of chocolate, he could get really quite sick or she could get really quite sick. As I have said before in the show, I love Maltese. And of course, Maltese are small dogs. And so I had to make sure that my dogs, after that one incident with Maui, never had any chocolate. Perhaps if I had a golden retriever like Maple, <laughs> I would think, you know, maybe not as I would be counting chocolate chips and doing some of that math equation. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, yes. And my beagle, who was small but sturdily built, they were both fine in the end because it turns out that there's a lot of cookie in comparison with the amount of chocolate in chocolate chip cookies. Mm -hmm. And so and then divided by two and the fact that I'd eaten one already and it was it was okay. But yes, it was a stressful moment. It's a pretty good rule of thumb. Let's avoid the chocolate altogether. But we're not done there yet. Yeah, no, exactly. And I have to say that the reason I was trying to work out how much chocolate was in the cookie is because they do have this fantastic chocolate dose calculator mm. that you can use and you can work out how much your dog has consumed and their body weight and da 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 da. And that was how I knew that we were probably in a safe ish zone and we could monitor them and not immediately rush off to the vets. And where will people be able to find this calculator? Well, we will put a link to that in the show notes. Of course, it does go without saying that these calculators only be used as a guideline. And if you have any concerns, always consult a vet if your dog eats any chocolates or potentially toxic material. So let's get a little bit into the science of what happens when a dog gets theobromine in their system. What makes it so toxic? Our vets say that when theobromine is ingested by dogs, it acts as a stimulant. And just like any stimulant, if you have too much of it, you can overdose. A minor overdose and they get a bit of a runny tummy and they might vomit. 
and give them a bit more, their heart starts having funny rhythms and they get excited, agitated and uncomfortable. Give them a bit more and they can do things like seizure. And if you give them more than that, they can die. Dr. Schmidt also says that pets who have had heart disease or kidney or liver disease are even more susceptible to poisoning from smaller amounts of theobromine. Oh, this is complicated, isn't it? Unfortunately, these kinds of poisonings happen all the time. Dr. Schmidt says that when it comes to people calling the Pet Poison hotline, chocolate is one of the most common calls because, of course, it's around our house and we don't think of it as a poison. Every year we do a top 10 toxins where we go through and look at what the top toxins were for that previous year. And it always makes the top of the list. Dr. Schmidt also says that rodenticide, which is a rat poison, is always a top call as well. And surprisingly to me, I didn't know this, but I know it has some strange properties, xylitol. Well, speaking of rat poison for a moment, uh, that same dog, Maui, who got into a bag of Hershey's Kisses, <gasps> no. once got into some rat poison. So <laughs> I'm very familiar with pumping the stomach of a dog. She lived to 16, remarkably. Oh. She had quite a following because I wrote a book that featured her. But uh, she, had, yeah. she is almost a dog that had nine lives. But you mentioned xylitol, and xylitol is that fake sugar that you have in chewing gum a lot of you know sugar-free gum yeah that is flavored by something called xylitol it's in other types of foods for like weight loss or diabetics type things because it has a really nice sweetening component to it you can see it in different types of gummies and chewable tablets and you know chewable medications or even liquid medications and so i think making sure pet owners are aware and I always tell everybody it's, it starts with an X, Y, L. So instead of looking for something on the ingredient list that starts with a Z, it's X, Y, L. And anything that could have that in there is really important to keep away from your pets. It can cause a significant drop in blood sugar. And then in larger amounts, it can cause liver failure to occur. In today's show notes, we will put a list of those top 10 poisons mm -hmm. that you should be watching out for. So we know that chocolate consumption is common with dogs, but Claire, guess what time of year, <clears throat> I may have hinted at it a moment ago, chocolate consumption in dogs increases. Well, we, even without that hint, my mind would go straight to another beagle who I knew whose owners had to take the beagle into the emergency vets on Christmas Day evening mm -hmm. because it got into all of the Christmas candy. So I'm guessing Christmas figures in this. You got it. Dr. Noble and his team thought that they would get into the Christmas spirit by doing what scientists do best, gathering and analyzing the data. Well, I'll be honest, it was a little bit of a Christmas, lighthearted Christmas observation. We wanted to see whether it seemed obvious that there'd be more chocolate eaten at Christmas because it's left all over the place by the youthful recipients of the chocolate Santas. And so we thought, well, we'll just, we'll just look it up. And look it up, they did. They worked closely with vets in the UK and collected data from recorded vet visits and found that, yes, not surprisingly, Christmas and Easter, those Easter eggs, saw a significant increase in chocolate poisonings. Now, after your story about the trail of Hershey's Kisses on Valentine's Day, mm -hmm. I'm surprised that Valentine's Day wasn't high up on that list as well. Well, you would think that, but Dr. Noble suspects that that might be because more of the chocolate on Valentine's Day goes to adults and they are less likely to leave it out. They just want to hoard it and eat it themselves <laughs> and, and, and keep it out of places that are easy to reach for children and, you know, pets. Yeah, well, and also, I mean, if I have chocolate, I put it in the fridge. Children don't care about these things, but yeah, we put uh -huh, it somewhere. Ah, that, yeah. <laughs> that is very true. Yeah. And they come in those beautiful heart-shaped boxes. They do. Well, I have to take your word for that. We don't have Hershey's Kisses in the UK. We wouldn't let it in. It's poor quality chocolate. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you now. The Hershey Kisses don't come in heart-shaped boxes. Oh, okay. That is true. Hershey Kisses are not available in Europe. Oh, there you go. Hmm. Yeah. But I'd rather have some of your European chocolates, but... Yeah. We won't even go there. <laughs> so let's talk about what happens if your dog does ingest a bunch of that Christmas or Easter chocolate. We asked Dr. Schmidt what someone can expect to happen if they have to take their dog into emergency vet for chocolate poisoning. Chocolate in dogs and cats is really slowly absorbed. And so 
we can get a lot of chocolate back even six hours, seven hours after the ingestion if we induce vomiting. And so that can definitely help slow down or decrease the severity of the signs that might develop. And then after that, depending on where we're still at and in the risk of concern and what came out with the vomit, we may follow that up with a dose of activated charcoal. Yes, I have uh, been there with all of that in terms of inducing vomiting and doing things to medics and, and then having veterinarians come back to me with this, like, what is this green stuff in oh. her? In her, And I was like, I think I gave her some omelet this morning with spinach. And they were like, Phew. so I've had all sorts. <laughs> Believe me, I have been there with my dogs. I, I've, I've spent a lot of money on pumping that one dog's stomach. It is important, as she mentions, to talk about the activated charcoal. The charcoal that the veterinarian was talking about is medical grade. It's not necessarily the stuff that you can just find in the store. So if you want to do this, make sure that you are using the right stuff. But really, this is something that you don't want to like guess at. You should go see a veterinarian. They need something that's a lot higher in concentration. And so medical grade activated charcoal. And what that help what that helps to do is to bind or pull kind of like a magnet. Takes that theobromine that's in the intestinal tract and helps to bind that to the activated charcoal. So then it gets defecated out, gets removed in the, in the stool. And then in other cases, we may need fluid therapy. So IV fluids, theobromine, is removed from the body through urine. And so by having them on IV fluids, it helps to increase the amount of that theobromine to be excreted out or to be removed out from the body. Depending on the severity of the poisoning, the veterinarian may choose to do one or all of these things. Okay, so we know why chocolate is dangerous to dogs, when to be extra vigilant, and how chocolate toxicity can be treated. So what do you say, Jim? Has the myth it's okay to give a little chocolate been officially busted? I think we can... Uh, <clears throat> anyway, drum roll, please. Busted. Dogs should not ever be given chocolate. Well, there you have it, folks. Chocolate is a no-go. We're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, we'll be discussing dogs eating grass. Is it because they are sick or just that they think they're cows? Find out next. And now, a message from your dog. Every day with you is like a day at the beach, and I want as many beach days as possible. I want to run and sniff and find a good stick to carry. I want to walk with you, run with you, sleep with you, eat with you. And when I eat with you, I want Everpup. It infuses any food you give me with health and life and vibrancy. I can feel it. It's a strange thing to do, sprinkle this powder on my food, but I wouldn't have it any other way. My time with you is precious and irreplaceable, and I'm thrilled to be with you for as long as possible. Here's to puppy playtime and senior snoozes. <laughs> no matter how old I get, I want my ever pup. It just makes me feel good in this life. And the next, and the next, and the next. I am so grateful to be your dog and for the ever pup you give me. So now that you know what your dog wants, get Everpup, the ultimate dog supplement. Everpup is available in select pet shops and on Amazon. But to get the best price possible, join the Everpup Club at everpupclub.com where you'll get your first jar for just $8 with free shipping anywhere in the U.S. Go to everpupclub.com and use the discount code DPN. That is everpupclub.com. Everpup, every day. Welcome back to Dog Edition. So we've already busted one myth. Let's look at another question. Dogs who eat grass, are they doing it because they have an upset stomach, they're feeling sick, or what? What do you think, Claire? 
I am really torn on this because I have one dog who was like a cow who just grazed when we went out on dog walks and just clearly just liked eating grass. But equally, I've had dogs who very clearly do it before they vomit. So you feel like they're doing it in order to bring something up. So clearly the one who ate it all the time was fine, but the other one was doing it to kind of bring up stuff in the stomach. So I I don't know. I don't know. I'd be interested to find out. Well, we went out to dog parks around the world to ask people what they think about dogs who eat grass and why they do it. Oh, yeah, she actually eats grass, like, all the time. They eat grass when their digestive tract needs it. I heard that this is a myth, that they eat grass when they're sick, and actually that they'll throw up. And my mom has, like, this little Australian shepherd dog that goes out and eats grass all day long and then just, like, throws up in the house, like, on the carpet every time. They eat grass often. They're not always sick when they do it, but, you know, I it it's supposed to help them throw up basically and feel better in some way i don't know i don't think so so while we were researching this issue we found a team who have done research into this very question dr benjamin hart and dr karen swader well the purpose was to understand grass eating and to uh, were they really feeling ill showing signs of illness or vomiting and uh, so you know We didn't know what to expect. And so what we ended up doing is we sent out a query. And what we found is that grass eating and plant eating is a very common behavior (laughs) in dogs. So after conducting their research about dogs eating grass, they published their findings in an aptly named paper. And of course, we will post a link to that paper in today's show notes. For this study, they collected survey data on dog age, sex, breed, if they had daily access to plants, how often they ate plants and what type they were and the frequency of illness or vomiting after the plant ingestion. So the finding that we got from our study actually seemed to contradict kind of that popular myth that dogs eat grass because they know it's going to cause them to vomit. Really, like only less than I think a quarter of dogs actually vomited after eating grass. And even smaller percentage, I think less than 10%, actually showed any signs of illness before eating grass. So very few dogs seem sick before eating grass and tend to vomit afterwards. They also found out that puppies are more likely to eat grass, but then no one's surprised at that because puppies do like to nibble things, don't they? (laughs) They like to experience the world by tasting it. So dogs don't seem to be eating grass because they are sick and they want to vomit. Why are they doing it? There are a few different theories out there. Some researchers suggest it's from a low fiber diet or a Mm. dog isn't getting enough nutrients from their food, but... This seems unlikely because dogs are pretty rubbish at digesting grass. There is no real consensus yet as to why they do it. The honest answer is no one actually knows the answer to this question. And some dogs do just eat grass because unlike cats, dogs are not strict carnivores. They are technically omnivores. That is vet Dr. Brittany Grenis. You may recognise her from our first Dog Miss debunked episode. She also says that some dogs have a condition where they just eat everything. So pica is just when they eat things that they shouldn't. You know, you have your dog that eats everything around the house, or cats do it too. And so they just eat all these random things. And sometimes we just don't know the reason behind it. We do think there's some sort of anxiety component to it or some sort of neurosis to it. Another possible reason for grass eating is something that I find fascinating. It's zoopharmacognosy. You say that like you know what that word means. What is it? It is fascinating. Here is Dr. Sueda again. So the idea that are animals actually purposely using certain plant materials or behavior to treat themselves, to treat illness... And so in other species, so for instance, like in chimpanzees, there have been reported observations of chimpanzees selectively eating certain types of plants, whereas it passes through their system. When researchers go out and look at chimpanzee poop, they find the grass material and there's like worms wrapped up in it or chimpanzees going out, for instance, and selectively looking for certain types of plants and wiping it on their fur. 
And they find that when they look at this plant material, it has some anti-parasite properties. So are these behaviors actually animals knowing what types of, of plants to use to actually treat illness or treat parasites or other processes? Isn't that cool, Claire? This is why I think this is such a fat... We, we are definitely going to do an yeah. episode on this whole concept of zoopharmacognosy. It's it's really fascinating. It's they're very much in its nascency, especially as it relates to dogs. But it's really, really interesting. And, you know, I immediately drew the parallel as well to humans because you and I both love food. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes when you just get that weird thing of you really want to eat something and it might not be something that you normally have. And and we sort of joke, don't we? We say, oh, well, maybe there's something in it that your body needs. And maybe there is. I believe that we as a species and, of course, dogs and chimpanzees and animals, if they listen to that little voice inside, mm -hmm. they know what to eat. And so that's my suspicion about yeah. why dogs eat grass. But not everyone agrees. This is, again, really on the fringes. Yeah. So what we're saying is, is it actually possible that dogs are eating grass to rid themselves of some sort of parasite? It is possible in street dogs or feral dogs. But veterinarians say... It's pretty unlikely in a lot of well-cared-for dogs that are up-to-date on their vaccinations and are given their medication when they have any parasites. But we wanted to dig a little deeper, <clears throat> pun intended, dig a little deeper, and see if maybe grass-eating is a remnant behavior of dog ancestors. Wolves. That's a wolf there. Could it be that grass eating is a behavior carried down through dog genetics from their wolf ancestors. We spoke to a wolf expert to find out. My name's Laura Schmidt. I'm the wolf curator at the International Wolf Center. I started working with wolves in 1986. The International Wolf Center is a science-based educational organization. It is located in Minnesota and it aims to advance the survival of wolf populations by teaching about wolves and how important they are to our ecosystems. Laurie has been working with the wolves there for over three decades. Wow, that's dedication. Though the wolves housed at the Wolf Centre are not technically wild, they are absolutely not domesticated, and so they have a very similar physiology and behaviour as free-range wolves, like those at Yellowstone National Park, for example. We asked Laurie about her observations of the wolves eating grass and why she thought they did it. She says that it is unlikely wolves eat grass because they are sick or, or to get them to vomit because in a pack setting, and dogs do this too, you do not want to appear sick or weak, right? So analyzing wolf vomit to see if there's any grass present is you know, kind of difficult. They just don't do it that often. When it comes to understanding grass eating in wolves, which they apparently do, Laurie says, it is likely comes down to what they had for dinner and what part of the animal they ingested. So for us, we feed a feast and famine diet. So differing than dogs, wolves have stomach receptors and have the ability to eat up to 20% of their body weight at one time. We see very dark, tar, kind of like scats that indicate that they're ate as much meat as they can process and they're expelling the excess meat. Laurie says oftentimes the best way to analyse wildlife diet is through their scat, you know, their droppings. And after feasting on a large... I know scat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's a type of music as well, Scat. But anyway, um, after feasting <laughs> on a large prey item, Laurie can watch their digestion process by looking out for the Scat. Day two or three into the Scats, we'll see dark, foreign, large Scats, oftentimes expressing the anal scent glands because there's such a large, massive amount of Scat. Day probably four and five in between a feeding, both wild and captive, that's when you start to see hair and that's a wrapping bone that's coming out of the system. These wolves are eating bones. These wolves are, are shards of bone are coming out of them. Okay, so let's just picture this for a moment. She says the hair from whatever animal they're eating does help to coat the intestinal tract to help pass the bones through the wolf as it eats. But towards the very end of their digestive cycle, 
they can see some evidence that the wolf has eaten some grass. Maybe six or seven days after feeding, the scat comes out just chalky white, very small chalky white digestive calcium, there's nothing left. So it's been our experience in the captive wolves is after that meat process has kind of gone through three or four days, the scats get smaller and we do see them consuming grass in that pattern when some of that non-digestible material is sitting in their gut. Mm. So in order to help get those dry and sharp bone bits out, the wolves eat grass to speed along the digestive process and they really are self-medicating in a way. A form of zoopharmacognosy, really. I love the fact that in dog edition we get into the scat when we need to, to really determine whether or not these myths are true or not. So Claire, based on what we've heard, everything, including all the scat, mm -hmm. what do you think? Dogs eating grass is a sign of an upset stomach? Busted. Here is Dr. Swader one last time. Really, only less than I think a quarter of dogs actually vomited after eating grass. And even smaller percentage, I think less than 10%, actually showed any signs of illness before eating grass. So very few dogs seem sick before eating grass and, you know, tend to vomit afterwards. So we kind of refuted that, that myth. Well, there you have it. We conclude this episode of Dog Myths Debunked, knowing that it is never a good idea to feed your dog any type mm -hmm. of chocolate. But if your dog is eating grass, it's likely that they just want to and you should let them. It's okay. They're probably not feeling sick. Or they think they're a wolf. <laughs> or they think they're a wolf. <laughs> which could happen. Yeah. Pesticides on another thing. We never even addressed pesticides, but don't let your dog eat grass that is, <laughs> has pesticides on it. Yeah, that's an interesting thing. In in Canada, and I guess maybe in America too, they put little signs on the lawn saying... Mm. We put little flags yeah. up. You do not do that in the United Kingdom? No. There you go. Ooh. But, of course, when you go around the United Kingdom, you see all these giant fields of, of grazing sheep. So I guess maybe you can let your dogs eat grass there. Maybe it's because it rains so often that as soon as they put any kind of pesticide mm. on the grass, it's washed off. I think that's probably my theory. <laughs> Could just be another episode of Dog Edition. Yeah. Who knows? Indeed. Well, that is all we have time for today. I want to thank you for bringing us along on your dog walk. We will have links in today's show notes to the various poison control centers that you can reach out to if your dog needs help, both in the United States and in the United Kingdom. The chocolate dose calculator as well. We'll have that just in case you have an unfortunate run-in with your dog and some chocolates. So if you want to make sure you are one of the first to listen to the next episode of Dog Edition, make sure you follow along in your podcast app. And if you want to help the show grow, then let your friends know about it as well. I'm Claire Mansell. And I'm James Jacobson. On behalf of all of us here at Dog Podcast Network, I'd like to wish you and your dog a very warm aloha. <laughs>